the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I would say from the singing we just had, we used to say in the old church, we had church. <laughs> Y'all took us to church. Good evening. I am so pumped up to be back in this beautiful place of pedantic, transcendent, effervescent, spirit-led place of worship. I love your pastor. You know why? You know why I love that guy? Not just because we share the same barber. <laughs> pastor, when they tease you, I got a divine word for you tonight. When they talk about our five head, not forehead, here's the word. God doesn't put marble tops on cheap furniture, baby. Keep shining for Jesus. I got your back, Pastor. My oldest son is a military officer. He's in Okinawa, Japan. And of course, he teases me because I have follic challenge capability, he calls me Baldilocks. That's all right, I got a nickname for him. It's called Heredity. <laughs> Just keep living, boy. Your day will come. How many like football? Oh, yeah. I love football, man. I played it, I coached it, my sons played it. I played middle linebacker. When I hit you, my nickname was Slobber Knocker. Slobber <laughs> would fly everywhere. Then I lift you up in Jesus' name. So football season is beginning again. That's right. Remember the Dallas Cowboys used to say, why is there a hole in our dome so God can look down and see his favorite team playing? <laughs> I'm not a Cowboy fan. Hey, hey, hey. I've been watching a semi-pro team for 10 years, the Cleveland Browns, so have mercy upon my soul. <laughs> and because it's near football season, I got to give you, as a football guy, coach, player, give you a football joke. A son was taking his mom to her first ever professional football game. He used to take his dad, but his dad passed away. So he decided, I'm going to take mom to the pageantry of the pig iron. And they get there, they are on the 50-yard line, 10 rows from their bench, and all the pageantry, and the jets flying over, and the star-spangled banner, and goose bumps flowing all over everybody's body. And they flip the coin, and the game starts. And it's an arch-rival game. It's hard. It's hard-hitting. It's rough. It's rugged. It goes into overtime. And the home team wins in a last second field goal. And mom was there for her first game to witness all of this pageantry and majesty of football. So the son was so excited and he took her to dinner and said, hey, mom, how did you like your first football game? And mom said, whoa, those guys are gigantic and they're so fast. And they hit so hard. But why don't they pay them much? They're very poor. The son said, Mom, no, 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 no. These guys make millions. I don't think so, honey. I listen. I, I watch. They're poor. 
He said, why do you say that? Well, when the game first started, there was a man who had a quarter. He flipped it in the air, and when it dropped, and all I heard the whole game was, get the quarterback, get the quarterback. They're poor. <laughs> the greatest country in the world, these United States of America. God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. You know what I wish? I wish more people in the United States had a chance to live overseas. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in Europe. People talk about Europe, you know, it's so great and modern and there's socialized medicine. Let me just give you a little talk about that, two seconds. I'm there in Germany, wunderbar, the Deutschland, Hemmeyor, and I'm working with General B.B. Bell, commander of Allied forces and 7th Army, and, and one of my buddies, his wife gets sick. She's in a fetal position in her office. Who knows what's wrong? He called me up and said, Ron, Autobahn, no speed limit. Let's go, baby. And we pick her up, and she's in pain. She's just convulsing, and we don't know what's wrong. So we get in the car, and we drive her to the, next, the, the, the first hospital we see, and we bring her in and say, doctors, help her. I'm Masadi. This is not stomach day, this is heart day. You must go find the hospital that treats stomachs. They wouldn't give her aspirin, they wouldn't give her nothing, and that's socialized medicine. I, all I do when I come home, I kiss the ground and lick it. I didn't thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm serious. Because what I know for a fact, it doesn't matter where you start in America, it doesn't matter how low you've been, in this country, if you try to help yourself, people will help you to get to the mountain because people are here understand God is on the throne and prayer changes things. I want to talk from Psalm 8, written by King David of the tribe of Judah, who was rejected by his own father. When prophet Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel, Jesse just knew it couldn't be David. So he asked David to go outside and be with the sheep. So when the prophet came to anoint with the shofar horn the next king of Israel, there were seven handsome, beautiful, saw-like sons, but the oil from the shofar horn would not flow. And the prophet asked Jesse, God is not a man that he can lie. He said, the next king of Israel is in this house. Seven sons are here. God cannot lie. Do you have another son? And Jesse's going, no. No, not the runt. Not the kid that's ADD. The hyperactive, can't stay out of dirt. Not the shepherd boy. Bring David in. David comes in, hi, 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 He didn't look like a king. He didn't walk like a king. He didn't talk like a king. But the Bible says God and man see differently. Man sees the outer appearance, but God sees the heart. He saw a young man and he said, he's a man after my own heart. And 
the oil from the shofar horn from the prophet Samuel began to flow on this little shepherd boy named David. Can I tell you something tonight? David was rejected. Some of you have been through rejection on the job, in relationships, in communities, from parents. You've experienced this horrible thing called rejection. But I want to give you a word tonight that man's rejected is God selected. The Bible says Jesus came unto his own, but his own received him not. He was rejected, but he was God's selected. So David sits down and writes this beautiful Psalm 8 about this existential, esoteric, pedantic thing we call man. He ponders the heavens, the galaxies, the stars, the black holes, the suns. He looks at all the various creations of the hand of God. And when he compares the majesty, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name above the earth. When I look at the stars and the heavens and all your creation, then I look at me and I ask the question, what is man? That you are mindful of him. And the son of man, that you care for him. Yet you've made him a little lower than the Elohim, than God himself. And crowned this thing, this creature, with glory and honor. And you've given dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, and sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the path of the sea. Oh, Lord! That, by the way, is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That means the word Jehovah, the God of creation. The Jews so revered the word, they took all the vowels out and just had the consonants. When they say the name of God, it's... His name is so holy... So majestic, so pure, so perfect, so without flaw. They couldn't even say the fullness of his name. So they put in just a breath. That's capital L, capital R, capital L-O-R-D, Lord. Then he goes to the next one. Oh, Lord, our Lord. That is the word Adonai, which means master. He is God of creation, and he is so vast that everything that created is, is sustained by his very word. But yet he's so caring, he's my individual master, and he hears my cries. O oh Lord, O oh Adonai, how majestic. Is thy name in all the earth. What is man? You know that we men are under attack in this new age, trying to destroy the very fabric of manhood today, to make men feel less than and that we're somehow toxic but not knowing that everything God has ever done, ever will do, he has done through his creative relationship through man. You know why you're hated so much? You know why the devil's after you, men? I don't mean to dismiss women, but I just want to talk to, we call it in Hebrew, minchkite. You know why you're hated by the devil who wants to destroy you? Because he knows who you are. He knows you're the linchpin to everything God wants to do in the world. You are the key. Well, he hates you because of this. When Satan, Lucifer, convinced a third of the angels to rebel against God and they failed, it must have been some dumb angels to believe they could take on God. 
But they lost, right? And so immediately a place called hell was created for them. No second chance, no redemption plan. When the, when the angels sin, it was don't pass go, don't collect $100, your destiny is hell. But when man sinned, when man rebelled against God, God stepped out of time into time to change time for all time. <laughs> if you say in the black church, can I say that one more again? <laughs> God, when man fell into sin, he stepped out of time into time to change time for all time through Jesus Christ. That's how much he loves you. But you know what's happened? The importance of man has been watered down by Satan and his forces and, and the media to make men think they're not what they used to be. The facts tell me that. That's why I built this place of hope. Do you know who's committing the most suicide in our country today? 30%. I'm, I'm, I'm a biracial guy. I'm a, half my family's white, half my family's black. They call me zebra. <laughs> it's the lion's favorite food. Why he can get white and dark meat at the same time. <laughs> I love my white family on the other half of my... I love them. They're great people. They're German. But do you know what's happening to the men who I love, a part of my family, that the group that's committing the most suicide in our country today are white men between 45 and 65, 30% higher than any other group in the country, men. Black boys are killing each other like it's target practice all over the country. They don't value life for each other. There's an attack demonically on men. Why, Dr. Ron, why is it so, so, so strategic and so, so, oh, what's this for? What's this for? Yes. No, no, no. This, this is the anointing. Feel it. Feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, man. Why are men the target? I can do my homework. You know, PhD, you got to do your work. You got to prove what you teach and understand. Let me give you some numbers. Just, to, just, just listen to me for a quick second. When a child gets saved first in a family, 3.5% of the time, the whole family gets saved. 3.5%. When a mother, God bless mothers, when mommy gets saved first in the family, 17.5% of the time, the whole family gets saved. Brace yourself, put on your seat belts, and get it in your mouthpieces. <laughs> when a father gets saved first, 93% of the time, the entire family gets saved. So, if you are the enemy of God and you want to destroy God's work and you understand that when a father commits himself to Jesus, that 93% of the time the whole family gets saved, who are you going to attack? But see, I don't still think you understand. Men, my guys, my boys, my posse in Jesus, I don't think you really understand your significance in God's creative plan, what God wants to do. When God ever did something to change the dispensation and the epoch of history, he always called out to one man first. Oh, y'all don't believe me? Let me prove my point. Let me do my deductive, inductive reasoning with you through my pedantic, nomenclature, academic jargon so I can explain the word of God.
when God wanted to save humanity from the flood, he reached out to one man and he said to a man named Noah, what's in your hand? You have a hammer? Build me an ark where there's been no rain, where there is no river or no ocean. And I want you to build this and preach for 120 years. One man and his family sustained the human race. He reached out to a community, no. To a city, no. To a committee, no. He reached out to one man. When God wanted to start his chosen people from which the Messiah would come, he reached out to one man, Abraham. Leave your mother and your father and go to a land you not know of and I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Look at the stars. Look at the sand. That will be your seed. He didn't call a committee. He reached out to one man. When God wanted to save this little nation from starvation, he gave one 17-year-old boy, a young man, a dream. His name was Joseph. And Joseph was used by God to be the prime minister of Egypt and save his family. One man. When God wanted to set the Hebrews free from the bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh that had lasted 400 years, he didn't call a nation, he didn't call a group, he didn't call a tribe. He reached out through a burning bush to one man and say, Moses, take off your shoes. The place you are standing is holy ground. Go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh Moses, let my people go. One man. God wanted to put the tribe of Judah on the throne of Israel. They would be the tribe to birth Jesus Christ. He reached out to one man, David. When God wanted to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, to the great unwashed, to the Greeks and the Romans and the Assyrians and all the different groups, he reached out to one man on a Damascus road. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? One When God wanted to save the world from sin and redeem it from the clutches of Satan and snatch the keys of hell and the keys of death and say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, God became one man. Dwight L. Moody once said, the world has yet to see what God can do with one man who is completely committed to his cause. Men, you are like tea bags. Yeah, you are. You don't know how strong you are till God dumps you in hot water. Oh, it's easy to be a tea bag in the cupboard. It's easy to be a tea bag in a jar. It's easy to be a tea bag in the, in the, in the kitchen. But one day God is going to grab you out of your dry place, out of your comfort zone. He's going to pick you up and take you to some boiling hot water and drop you in it. You're going to think he doesn't love me. <laughs> I was happy in the cupboard. I enjoyed being in the jar. I was in great fellowship in the refrigerator. But God is saying, that's not why I designed you. That's not what you were made for. That's not why I created you to stay dry. I designed you to be dunked. <laughs> why? Because when God dumps a tea bag in hot water. When you put the tea bag in the morning in boiling water, something miraculous.
begins to happen. The clear aqueous solution is transformed by the Duncanization. <laughs> New word. The color of the water starts to change. The smell of the water starts to change. The very taste of the water starts to change. The viscosity of the water, which means the thickness, the more the tea bag is in it, the very nature of the tea bag is transluted through the sharing process and the water becomes thicker. That's why you have a dysfunctional family. Hot water, so God can dunk you to change them. That's why your job is crazy, so God can dunk you to change the job. That's why God has put you in this season, in this time of insanity, so he can dunk the church in the water and change the nation. <laughs> Don't complain about the hot water. Don't run from the hot water. Don't bemoan the hot water because the hot water gets to prove the scripture that says, greater is he that is in you, teabag, than he that is in the water. See, Lord, dunk me. Dunk me, Jesus. When I played football, we used to say, pressure is a privilege for the great players. They want the ball with the game on the line. They want the ball with two seconds left. They want the, the play called to them. They thrive under pressure. So I asked my football players, I'm gonna ask you tonight, are you a pipe or are you a diamond? Are you a pipe? Oh, we have guys in football who live in the weight room, bench pressing 500 pounds. <sighs> And they squat the whole house. Hey, hey, you. Hey, who? And they're ripped and they're cut. When the game starts, ah! Ah! Ah, that hurts! We, <laughs> we say about those players, Pastor, they look like Tarzan, but they play like Jane. Are you a diamond or are you a pipe? Pipes under pressure and over time will burst and leak and lose their power. But diamonds under pressure and over time get stronger, more brilliant, more radiant, more valuable, more priceless. That's what Paul was trying to say when he said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are diamond. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. So how does God make his men that change the world? Can I tell you some news that breaks my heart? Boy, I enjoyed you guys. You guys could sing. Boy, I'm telling you. People think I can sing because I have a pretty deep voice. I can't. <laughs> I went to college to take a singing class. True story. I paid my money. I went in the classroom with other people. And you had to sing for about three minutes so they could assess where you were, you know, what level of songality you have. <laughs> and so I got up to sing the Star Spangled Banner. After 3.5 seconds, stop! 
was getting warmed up. She said, Mr. Archer, I want you to go back to the bursar and get all your money back. <laughs> True story. We can't help you. I said, you're school. This is a class. You're a teacher. You are tone deaf. What does that mean? When we switch tones, you still, ah. <laughs> so when the scripture said make a joyful noise, I'm, 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 I'm the pitcher next to that. How does God make his men? I'm going to tell you something that's going to shock you. I want you to hear these. I, want you, I do not want you to be comfortable tonight. My job as a world leader is to do two things, to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. So I want you to be uncomfortable tonight. I want you to hear what's going on in your world in this country. 72% of black babies born in the United States are born out of wedlock and are raised by a single parent. 72% in 1960, it was 22%. What did that? Welfare. Welfare said, if you're by yourself, if you have a child, we'll give you money. If the man comes back home, nothing more. So the sister said, well, my sweet daddy, Uncle Sam, will take care of me. Bye, Charlie. Listen to me. 55% of Hispanic children are born out of wedlock and live in single-parent homes. 35% of white children are born out of wedlock and live in single-parent homes. Black women, sisters, make up 7% of the U.S. population and they're having 40% of the abortions. You hear that number? You know why? Because Planned Parenthood targets them. They build their facilities in urban areas and they target desperate, lonely, broken, confused young women and 40% of African American women are killing their futures. Did you know that more black babies are being aborted than born in New York City? And guess what? See how the devil works? I do my homework, folks. 80% of all the social ills in our nation, high school dropout, teenage pregnancy, young drug addiction, juvenile detention and jail, runaways. Hear me. 80% have one cause. It's not racism. It's not poverty, it's fatherlessness. Did you hear me? Fatherlessness. Men who've learned to be breeders but not fathers. And yet, where this genocide is happening in many urban cities, the black church is either silent or complicit. I know this ain't popular preaching. I said, I'm here to make you uncomfortable. I don't care if people like me. I get a dog. <laughs> My dog are like me. I'm serious. My son, who's a military man, said, you know, we're not friends. That's not in the job description. If we happen to become friends, good. But my job is to make sure you become what God has called you to be, even if it means I put my foot in your blessed assurance. <laughs> now, my son's bigger than me. When he was 16, he was six foot two, 225. He thought he could take the old man now. Oh yeah, you know how boys get, they start smelling themselves. <laughs> so, he has a little friend, he was taken out, he said, hey pops, trying to show off, you know, give me the keys. 
it's my car. I said, excuse me? I said, I'm sorry. I'm getting old. I don't hear very well. Come closer. <laughs> Take a little walk with me. So, you know, he comes, you know, muscles now playing football. He walks, you know. He can look down on me now. He's six foot two. I said, give me, but before he could say the word key, I hit him right in the solar plexus. Boom! I said, what do you want now, boy? Air! <laughs> Can I have some air? <laughs> See, y'all don't get this. Children have to believe that dad's a little crazy. It's a little bit, not a whole lot. It's a little bit. Just enough to make him go, I think he's crazy. <laughs> I told my son, I will get rid of you and make another one look just like you tomorrow. <laughs> You ain't that special, boy. <laughs> so as I bring myself into some kind of construct that you can follow, I want to tell you how God uses men to change a society. In the Bible, we have two words for time, basically, in the Greek. Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is human time, the clock, anniversaries, birthday, going to work on time. Everything is based upon time. We have to get to places on time, close the sermon on time. <laughs> True story. My, my grandmother's German, full German, and she was old in my church, you know, and she was hard of hearing, Granny. So when I was a young pastor, pastor, I thought I had to preach the whole Bible. You know, when you're young. And so I'm on point number seven. And my grandmother goes, you know, she thinks she's whispering, but everybody can hear her. And she says, oh, that's ridiculous. People have to pee. <laughs> So the next words out of my mouth were in conclusion. <laughs> Real simple. Three sets of time. Kronos, Kairos. Under Kairos are three dispensations. Set time, mean time, the appointed time. How men are made into men of God. The set time is God gives you a preview of coming attraction. You ever go to the movies? You see previews, right? Now it's like 80 of them, right? Get to the movie! But God gives us preview of what's coming. That's called a calling. That's called a vision. That's called a dream. Joseph had a dream. Paul had a vision. David was anointed. Moses had a burning bush. You get to see why you were created. But he doesn't leave you there. He gives you a glimpse, a taste gives you a sprinkling, gives you a flavor, gives you a little bit of a glance look at your future. Then God allows life to grab you and pull you in the opposite direction of the very thing he told you you were going to do. We call that the meantime, where men get gripped, ripped, stripped, flipped, whipped, equipped, then shipped. Happened to Paul, happened to David, gripped, stripped, ripped, flipped, whipped, then dipped, equipped, and shipped. The meantime is a tough time for a man. Your ego has been crushed. Your pride has been shattered. Your manhood is in question. 
You've been abandoned and rejected. Your plans have failed. You got fired. You got laid off. Friends have betrayed you. Ideas have failed you. And now you find yourself alone in this dark, dank place called the pit. Joseph was in the pit. David was in a cave. Jesus was in a tomb. Moses backside of the desert. Every man of God spends time in the pit. But PIT means something. Profit in training. <laughs> He's not punishing you. He's not trying to kill you. He's letting you know that your strength in itself ain't enough to do what he's called you to do. Your IQ is not big enough. Your muscles are not strong enough. Your experience is not daunting enough. You need more than you. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. But men don't learn that until we're crushed. Because we grow up trusting our guns. Mwah, mwah. <laughs> There's no need to fear. Underdog is here. I'm going to tell you a secret that God taught me that changed my life. Anything that goes forward with tremendous speed and momentum in the kingdom of God must first be pulled backward. An arrow in a bow to go forward must what? Be pulled back. A rock in a slingshot before it can be, must go what? Back. The hammer of a gun must first go where? Jesus descended before he what? So men get pulled. So God showed you the destiny. That cross is your destiny. And yet life is pulling you, pulling you through failure after failure, setback after setback. And you're way back here. You think you're too old now. You're too beat up. I can never get there. Why did God do this to me? I feel broken and busted and disgusted. I don't think I can make it. What you don't understand, baby, you are in God's release program. He's pulling you back. And the further back he pulls you, the more viscosity and power and velocity he will have when he releases you. But God is not going to release you as long as you are whining and complaining and moaning and why is this me and why did God I thought he liked me God said he ain't ready yet pull it back further when you whine and complain all the time 80% don't care and 20% glad it's happening to you Like this hound dog sitting on a porch. <laughs> and he's howling. When you raise boys, you gotta make animal sounds all the time. The hound dog is howling, but he's just staying there. The mailman comes by. And the mailman says to the owner, hey, what's wrong with your dog? He's howling and whining, but he doesn't move. Is he okay? Owner said, you mean old Rusty? Oh, he's all right. He's just sitting on a nail. But he's too lazy to move. <laughs> He'd rather just howl about it. How many people do you know who are sitting on nails and all they want to do is whine, but they never want to get up and do something about it? Sometimes you got to get up and move. Get off that nail. You know when God releases you out of the pit? And when God releases you, let me tell you something what happens. It happened to me. I'm going to close out in a minute here. So here you are, like a rag Jesus would use. <laughs> Has that rustic look. <laughs> My kind of rag, man. Football rag. Hand me a rag, Tony! <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Here you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> Say, Pastor, don't bring him back. He's ill. <laughs> So here is your destiny. Here are you. And you think, it's too late. I'm too broke. I don't have enough time. God, you showed me this, and I, it'll take me forever to get there. But when God releases you out of his slingshot, when God releases you out of his bow, you are not traveling in linear velocity. The Bible says you are the light of the world. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. The sunlight reaches us 93 million miles in eight minutes. So that means when God releases you through the training, through the process, you're no longer moving. You're moving so fast that so much gravitas, gravity of the Holy Spirit in God is released in you that your destiny that seemed to be a million miles away because of the gravitas of God is bent to you. A day with the Lord is like a thousand years. And a thousand years it's like a day. What would take you a thousand years to do in your family? God can do it in one day. One day. And all you have to do by faith is take that step into the new dimension, then it pops back out. And you go from here to here. Not in your own strength but in the favor and power of God. This is not theoretical physics. I've lived it. Do you know who I am? I'm not just a guy that made a million bucks at 28 as a businessman. I'm not just a guy that planted 50 churches around the world. I'm not just a presidential advisor to President Bush and other presidents. That's not who I am. When I was 10 years old, guys, ladies, I put a gun to me to blow my brains out. I wanted to blow my brains on my mother's wall. My mom was a prostitute. She got raped by men and she was pregnant and they tried to abort me three times with drugs and with hangers. And I was born premature. My ears and nose and throat didn't connect. I couldn't breathe right. My lungs didn't work. I was raped with a broomstick by a crazy babysitter. They called it pin the tail on the donkey. See, some of y'all are poor. You're lucky. We will poe. We couldn't afford the R. It was on layaway. <laughs> we hoped to be poor. My mother was turning tricks, selling her body to grown men at 16, 17, 18, 19. My grandfather was in jail. My grandma was dying of cancer. We were atheists. We didn't go to church. There was no Bible. There was no God in our lives. It was hopelessness. My three uncles, too, were heroin addicts at 12 and 10, shooting up under their tongues and behind their eyes, you name it. Gun battles in my house. One guy broke my nose because my mother didn't do him right. And by 10 years old, guys, I wanted to die. I had no dad in my house. Didn't know, in the ghetto we used to say, mama's baby, papa's maybe. I knew who my dad was. Mom was a prostitute. It could be anybody. Any, many, mighty, mo, Pick a guy by his toe. Do you know how hard it is to grow up without a father in the inner city? I didn't know what manhood was. I tried. I didn't know. Give an example. We're almost done. You know, I, start, I was in puberty, and I started to shave. I didn't know how to shave. There was nobody that, you know, these little things that you take for granted that, Dad, well, first you pull your skin up, son, and you take some foam, and then you take the razor, a nice sharp razor, and you shave against the grain very gently, and you splash on some aqua velva. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Well, I didn't have that, so I was getting hair, and it was school I went to, I got a scholarship to an all-male school, I couldn't have hair, so I, I said to the barber, I need to shave. No, black men don't shave, son. We use something called functinitis. 
It's called magic shave. How many black men know about that? Black brothers. Anybody black brothers in here? Let me see. Come on. Any black brothers? Ah, you know about magic shave, right? Ha ha! See? I got a witness. What is magic shave? Let me educate you on, on, on blackology here. You take this can of powder. It's called magic shave. You take two tablespoons. You put it in the glass. You add water. You mix it up. It smells like death. My mom would go, what did you eat last night, boy? It's bad. Is it bad? It'll clear the house out. Stand up, man. They don't see you. How bad is it? That's right. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so again, not having a dad, I, I, the instruction says take a butter knife and put it on your face and let it, let it dry for three minutes. Well, I wanted a real clean shave, so I left it on for 15 minutes. <laughs> True story. Then it says take the dull side of the butter knife. Well, I wanted a clean shave. So I took the sharp side of the butter knife, and I began to scrape it off. And I know why it's called magic shave, Pastor, because your face magically disappears. <laughs> I had three degree burns on my face. Do you know, I have, I have coached some of the greatest players in the NFL, but you know what I missed when I played football? I saw my friends riding on their father's shoulders. I never had that experience. Or to him, my dad say, good job, son. My mom would say, kick a home run. <laughs> Thanks, mom. I wanted to die. I was lost. I was broken. I was raped. I had no understanding of God. But three people changed my life. I want to close with this. You are the hands anthropomorphically of God. You are the voice of God. Where you work, in your neighborhoods. Three Christians saved me. One was a teacher in my black school, white old lady from Mississippi. That's all she said at Mississippi. Honey, God don't make no junk, baby. <laughs> and she was the first person to give me a Gideon Bible. And I read something that changed me. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. You know what that meant to a prostitute's kid, to a trick baby? You know what that meant? That God knew me and that he had set me apart for something special? Wow. Then my best friend's mom, on Christmas Eve, his father went to get them some cranberry sauce. He was shot, robbed, and killed. They found his body on Christmas Day in a dumpster. His name was Richard. His mom's name was Dolores. She was a widow on Christmas Day with three kids in the ghetto of Cleveland. If anybody had a right to leave the church and, and turn their back on God and, and, and why would you do this to me? Instead, she turned her pain into power and picked up raggedy kids like me and said, I'm taking you to church. Every Sunday, this woman would pack me in her little Nova and take me to the Good Shepherd Baptist Church, Pastor Eddie L. Hawkins. He was a Marine. Just what I needed. I'm lost in this man, shoulders back, chest out. Dallas Seminarian. Boy, you might be poor, but your shoes can be clean. And this man took me under his wing and fathered me. He made me appreciate the Bible. He had a big library. It smelt of books. And I said to him, I think I'm called to preach. He said, but you're a stutterer. I know, but I'm still, still, I'm still caught. 
Calm down, son, you're hurting yourself. I said, I'm called to preach. He said, okay. I'm going to give you a month to prepare your trial sermon. Hope by then you can talk. It would help. <laughs> your first trial sermon, man, it's serious. My first time ever speaking in public. I'm a stutterer, but I don't care. I know what God had done for me. I became a straight-A student, graduated Valley Victorian. God had changed me, but I'm still dealing with this stuttering problem. And I get up to preach, let no man despise thy youth. And I get up there, I say, God, please help me. Help me, Lord, help me. You know I'm dysfunctional. You know I was born premature. You know I got so many health problems. You know, Lord, my whole family's not saved. But I trust you and I believe you. And I'm going to step in this pulpit and, Lord, help me. And my God, did he show up. I mean, he just... I'm watching. Go ahead. Go for it. Now, guess what? I'm still a stutterer. I never do it when I preach. When I'm home watching football, go, 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 go. That, 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 was, what, what, that, was, that was holding. I'm serious. I don't stutter because it's not my words. It's not my mouth. And it's not my time. It's his time, his words, and anthropomorphically, his mouth. Final story, and I'll be done. I'm on TV now. I made my first million dollars at 28 as a businessman. That's a special feeling as a young black poor kid from the ghetto. Can I tell you something, though? When you make a million dollars in the ghetto, you don't change, but everybody around you changes. <laughs> Hi! I always knew. <laughs> I'm preaching on Mother's Day. And the black church is called Big Hat Day. <laughs> I know where all the UFOs are. They're on Mother's Day in the church. Gigantic hat. You can't even see faces. Sombreros. If the wind comes, everybody's going. <laughs> I'm a young preacher. It's Mother's Day. I got my sermon all prepared, you know, all my exegesis and hermeneutics and homiletics, and, you know, it's all prepared. And my mother shows up for the first time in her life in a church. She don't understand church etiquette. She has a fishnet stockings and a mini skirt and a halter top. That's what she wears. She sits way in the back because she's kind of ashamed, but she has to come see her son, the one they tried to abort three times. And look at what God is doing. She had to come see. You know, Pastor and I talked about this. This is scary. When, you know, we're all preparation freaks. We prepare, prepare. It takes eight hours of preparation to preach one hour on Sunday. And God said, forget your sermon. Trust me. I don't have anything. You, know, you become 12 again. I, I don't have anything. I, I have my note. God said, trust me. Preach from Hebrews 11. I never, shut up! <laughs> okay. So I get up. I mean, I'm nervous now. <clears throat> take, your Bi <clears throat> take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews 11. Let's find out what God is going to say. Because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this is a packed house and mom is there. And so I trust God. I read. I begin to understand, oh my goodness, this is the hall of faith. Where all the heroes are, Gideon and Moses and David and, and Abraham and Jacob and all Joshua. But I didn't know something. I learned that moment. Only two women are in that hall of faith. Only two of all the men that are there, only two women are included. One is Sarah, which makes sense. She's the mother of the Jewish people. But guess who the other woman God would allow to be in the hall of Hebrew faith? She wasn't Hebrew. She wasn't even a believer. She was an outcast. She was a harlot. She was a brothel owner. Her name was Rahab. And when I preach,
preached that God gave grace and mercy to a prostitute and included her in the lineage of Jesus. My mother jumped up. That's the kind of God I want. You know, Baptists, you have two invitations. One, you open the doors of the church for two reasons. One, to be saved, to accept Christ as your personal Savior, and to renew your life in Christ in case you fall away. So I opened the doors of the church and said three questions. Let us stand. Let us stand. Come on. You're Baptist now. Come on. <laughs> what I asked my mom that day, I'm going to ask you. One... Is what you're doing working? And my mom shook her head. Second question, are you tired of hurting? Mom shook her head. And the third question, do you really want to change? Not just for you, but the generations to come. And my mom shook her head. And I said, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes upon him should not perish but have ever lasting life. God demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And my prostitute mother came to Jesus. And because she was the oldest of the seven kids in her family, when she got saved, she became the Apostle Pauline. Everybody got saved in the family. Granny, grandpa, aunts, uncle, uncle Buster, uncle Pee-wee, everybody. <laughs> now we planted 50 churches, goo gobs of businesses and real estate to help the poor and the homeless, and now a place of hope to help burned out pastors. And all my family is involved. Everybody. You know why? Because God oh, calls one person. And that one person can be used to save Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. But it starts with one word. Yes. Can I tell you a secret? I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil. So the reason I'm alive is for this purpose right now. Would you bow your heads, please? If there's anybody here today who knows church, who knows Sunday school, but you're not really sure if you have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I was sent here just for you today. That's why I wasn't aborted, so I could have this time at this point in God's plan to share his good news with you. So the same thing God did for me and my family, he will do for you and yours. But first, you must surrender to him. You must admit that you need him. You must say, Lord, help me. Please help me to help my family come to know you. And if you are here, nobody's watching now. It's between me, you, and God. We're just friends now. We're family. If you're not sure about your place with God, but you want to make up your mind today, this is it! Would you just raise your hand? Nobody's watching. Just raise your hand and say, I want Jesus as my Savior. I need Jesus. I, need, I, I really need him. 
I'm struggling. I see your hand up there. God bless you, sweetheart. Come on, anybody else? Don't be afraid. It's you and God. Just raise that hand. Nobody, I promise you, I see you back there. I just want you to say this as, you, as your hands are raised to heaven, not me, to heaven. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I fall short of your glory. But I also know you took all my sins and faults to Calvary. You died in my place so I could receive the love of God and become a child. I don't know everything, Lord, but I know I need you. Come into my life right now. I invite you in to save me from hell and death and Satan. I today acknowledge you are Lord of all. And I submit myself to you and help me to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe there's some of you right now who are Christians, but you need a special, mm, be revived to help your families and you're hitting blocks. God sent me here just to pray with you. But if you are here this evening, just come down for a minute. Come so I can pray with you. Don't be afraid. Come, 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 come. Come, 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 come. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Come on. Come on. I know you're here. God has sent me to an empty place. Come. There you go, sweetie. Come on. Come on, come on. You got family members. You got things in your lives that are not. Come on down. Come, this is where it happens, the miracle, when we are united together in prayer and we surrender ourselves. Come on, there's more. You have family members you want to reach. You want more power. You want more of God in your life. Come on. Let us agree together for your mother, for your father, for your wife, for your husband, for that wayward child who just seems not to be unreachable. I was that unreachable child and God reached me. So what God gave to me, I want to be an Elijah to your Elishas. Come. Come, let's pray together if you are here. You have family members you want to pray for. You want to reach them, your children, your grandchildren. Can I tell you why I'm doing this? I met my dad when I was 28 years old. My dad was a lawyer. He said to me, he wasn't a believer at the time, he said, you ever thought how God found you, son? I said, no. He said, you don't know this, but my dad, your grandfather, was a pastor. And he prayed for the generations yet unborn. God answered his prayer and found you. You want to see your family change? God called one man, Moses, one man, Joseph, one man, David, and changed generations. But it starts with humility. Father, I pray for those who have come humbly. You know their needs, oh God, better than anyone in this church. You know the storms they're in, the battles they're fighting, the enemies that are at the gate, the children who have gone astray, the husband who doesn't come home when he's the wife who's angry and bitter. The finances are stretched beyond compare. The grandchildren, you know, you know, you know, but you saved me. To let them know there's grapes in the land. There's hope in Jesus. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.